Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The passage we'll talk about tonight is that psalm, Psalm 143, that we read together at the beginning of the service. Dear friends in Christ, Hugh Grant, Richard Nixon, Rob Lowe, Bill Clinton, what do you think these four men have in common? Obviously, there are names that all of us recognize. They're internationally famous. Two of them are actors whose faces are recognized everywhere and whose work has been very well received. And the other two, of course, we know were politicians who are at the peak of world power serving as presidents of the United States. So, what is it that they all have in common? As we look at their lives, what we know they have in common is the fact that they all have had scandal as a part of their lives. They all have had a time that they would probably all say was the rock bottom of their life. And each has taken the plunge on a worldwide stage with international coverage. Grant, Lowe, and Clinton's downfalls all involve the public exposure of sexual sin. And of course, Nixon's downfall was the political nightmare of Watergate. But was that the end of their lives? Was that the end of their careers? Was that the end of anybody hearing about them? We know that that wasn't the case. For what these four men also have in common is that the public exposure of their guilt and shame was there, but it wasn't the end. Instead, all of them, at least to some extent, a pretty great extent, have had their reputations rehabilitated. For instance, by the end of his life, Richard Nixon was basically pretty well respected once again, remembered more for his great achievements in foreign policy than maybe he was for Watergate. Kind of hard to believe in a way, but as I was looking into this, I read an article about Richard Nixon, and in 1986, 12 years after Watergate, he was helping out behind the scenes with foreign policy, and he actually, in a Gallup poll, made it into the top 10 of most admired men in America. Top 10. I couldn't believe that. I didn't remember that at all. Now, Bill Clinton's situation was kind of similar, though all of us, and we talked about this in the sermon three weeks ago, all of us remember the Monica Lewinsky situation, but given the sad state of our economy, people hearken back more and more to that time in the 90s when Clinton and his administration were given credit for what was then a booming economy and something even more rare than that, a surplus in our national budget. And Clinton, as time goes on, is becoming more and more respected today as a statesman in our country and throughout the world. Certainly Hugh Grant and Rob Lowe recovered pretty well from their downfalls too. They've gone on to make many more movies and television experiences, and they're both pretty well respected for their acting abilities. So all four of these men had terrible experiences in their lives, and they have all grown past them, at least as far as their public reputations go, and the judgment of the bulk of people and as we know, people in our country are pretty forgiving. If you're willing to admit that you've done something wrong, Americans, by and large, get around to be pretty forgiving people. As I've already mentioned, tonight is the sixth and final Wednesday of our midweek Lenten series on penitential psalms. And that psalm that we all read together a little while ago was 
Psalm 43. It's a psalm of David. And ancient translations attribute this psalm to that time when it was getting nearer and nearer to the end of David's life, when his throne as the king of Israel was being severely threatened and under attack. And as it happened, he was under attack at the hand of his own son, Absalom. Now, we talked about David's experience with Bathsheba and Uriah a few weeks ago. And when you think of that, this could be looked at as a little bit of a case of what goes around comes around. David acted treacherously with someone close to him, so then sometime later, someone close to him acted with terrible treachery toward him. We did talk a few weeks ago about the terrible, murderous treachery of David himself when he had an affair with Bathsheba, who was the wife of his most loyal soldiers, Uriah. And of course, she became pregnant. David went so far in trying to cover up his sin that he actually had Uriah killed. David confessed his sin. God forgave him. But still, in this world, this side of heaven, there were consequences. Not only did the son born to David and Bathsheba die, but again, not terribly long after that, one of David's own sons, Absalom, rose up against him with an army, and Absalom began to act as the king of Israel in the place of his father. And Absalom's armies pursued David to solidify his claim to be the king. What a nightmare. And it came to no good end, with David's armies falling behind in the battles at first, but ultimately David's armies rallied and they defeated the armies of Absalom. But in the end, Absalom himself was killed in battle. And here David was in total misery, weeping over the loss of yet another son. Now, through this whole process, like the four men that I mentioned in the beginning, David actually began himself a process of rehabilitation in his own life. Rehabilitation, not so much of his reputation, but instead rehabilitation of his spirit through growing in spiritual maturity, growing in remembrance of the life that, that God has with him, the, knowing the fact that God is almighty and cares for him in all his ways, knowing that God is merciful. David grew to understand this more and more in his life. In two times of crisis that we see in Psalm 38 that we read about three weeks ago and tonight in Psalm 143, when you look at those two psalms, you can see that there is a subtle change in the attitude of David that shows this growth in his faith, this growth in his spiritual maturity. And that becomes the lesson that you and I can take away from this last Wednesday in our Lenten series. A few weeks ago when we were talking about Psalm 38 and David's coping with the whole mess with Bathsheba, I was really surprised by the tenor of David's attitude throughout that whole psalm. David did confess his sin to God, to be sure, but in none of those 22 verses of Psalm 38 did David sense and recognize and acknowledge God's forgiveness and God's mercy toward him. It's as if David was pouring out his soul to confess and did not receive back from God the forgiveness that he so longed for. So David really just begged for mercy and implored for help in that psalm, and that's the way the psalm ended. Tonight's psalm, Psalm 143, is much different. You can see there's a change. You can see there's growth and maturity in David. When you look at the psalm, it's very obvious. David is in quite a bit of trouble. 
In fact, it almost starts out the same way that Psalm 38 did. And again, the trouble was coming from his own son Absalom. So David writes at the beginning of tonight's psalm, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, enter not into judgment with your servant. For no one living is righteous before you. The enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. You can see David's being pursued. And he is looking to God for help. Right away, though, he recognizes God's faithfulness. He recognizes God's righteousness. He acknowledges God's ability to deal with the situation that's totally beyond him. Then David really shows some growth and maturity in taking the next step that speaks to us. David writes, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the works of your hands, and I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. The important thing here is that instead of wallowing in the terrible problem that was at hand, which was basically what David did throughout Psalm 38, he instead changed the focus and he stopped talking about the bad things that were happening, and he took the time to look back. He took the time to remember, to remember the days of old, and especially to remember what God had already done in his life in past times when he was in crisis. So you can see, as you think about events in David's life, you can see David hearkening back to God, giving him the strength to rescue his sheep from the mouths of lions. And he had to remember God giving him total faith and the courage to face and defeat the giant Goliath when nobody else in Israel wanted to be anywhere near Goliath. And David had to remember those numerous times that the Lord shielded him and delivered him when King Saul was chasing after him and Saul wanted to kill David. So here, when David's in a really tight spot being chased by his son Absalom's armies, instead of despairing, he stopped to remember how God had always helped him. He stopped to remember and recall God's constant presence with him. And that fueled David's faith. It fueled his prayers in the present time. So in the end, David was able to pray and pray with confidence. He said, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. In your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies. You will destroy all the adversaries of my soul, for I am your servant. Notice, David isn't begging here with an attitude of just hoping against hope that God maybe might do something. But in confidence, David was praying, knowing that the Lord was surely with him, that the Lord was going to answer his prayer, and he would do it in accord with his own good will and in his time. That was clearly praying and living in faith with the expectation of God's provision and protection. Of course, that's the message for us. David had faith all his life. But like so many of the major figures of the Bible, and some that come to my mind immediately are Abraham and Jacob, David, like Abraham and Jacob and many of the others, hit road bumps in their lives. David had road bumps in his life, in his faith, in his relationship with the Lord. But in the end, David grew through the tough experiences. He matured in his faith. So he surely is one that we can respect and we can emulate because all of us face tough circumstances in our lives at some point or another. The people we love and care for 
face difficult circumstances in their lives as well. The world in which we live is a challenging place and it's been particularly a tough place for the last four or five years. What it takes for us to live well in all circumstances, especially as Christians, what it takes for us is to have a growing, maturing faith. A faith that always recognizes that we have sin, that we recognize what it is that damages our relationship with the Lord. And also a faith that knows that already, through Jesus' suffering and death on the cross, the guilt of our sin has been taken away from us forever. And the ultimate consequence of our sin, namely death itself, has already been overcome by Jesus' resurrection. So we have been given faith to know that the Lord is real. And Jesus reminds us of his constant presence in Matthew 28 when he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the faith that we have been given by God informs us that in all circumstances, Christ is with us and we never need to be dragged down into despair. What's going on in our lives may knock us for a loop temporarily. It may knock us down to the ground for a time. But with ma mature faith, we know that the Lord never abandons his own. Jesus also tells us in Matthew 25, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Come to me, you who are facing tough decisions, tough circumstances in your life. Come to me and I will give you rest. So from David, today we learn that when we're down, we come to the Lord. We acknowledge him as the almighty and forgiving one. In the midst of our struggles, we do not lose heart, but we go back into our memories to recall everything Jesus has done to help us in the past. And we also then pray, trusting that the Lord will deliver us. Because God doesn't just save us once in our lives in the past and then turn his back on us and abandon us. That's not God at all. Instead, he is with us in all circumstances. So we pray, as David did at the end of Psalm 143, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. And in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies. You will destroy the adversaries of my soul, for I am your servant. That is rehabilitation. That is maturity of spirit. That is growth of faith that we all want to strive for every day and achieve with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.